In today's video, folks, we're going to take a look at this massive jewelry hoard which I just purchased at an estate sale. Everything on this table, which is stacked, as you can see, cost me exactly $205. I just bought it this morning, literally 30 minutes ago, so I have not even gone through it. But I'm going to go through some of this today. I'm going to talk about how I price items, especially when I get them in a large lot, such as this. Let's go find some treasure. How to cousins, how you do today? This is old Rusty the reseller and I just got a really awesome lot for $205. Trays full of jewelry which has been kind of jostled about uh, on the trip over here to the warehouse. I got a uh, unit 25A uh, at Asterisk six. Uh, that was the that was one of the ones uh, that was not being used today. And so I booked that, uh, I'm in here now. And so before we can get into talking about uh, exactly how I price this stuff, we first need to discuss how I go about sorting and inspecting these things to determine value. That's one of the first things I do. So what happens is I lay it all out. I'm going to go through these sections one at a time. I got my handy uh, trash can here for stuff that's broken that has no value or it's super cheap. That's going to go away immediately. All right. And then down on the floor here, I've got several um, containers. And in these containers, I'm Gonna, this is how I will sort initially. Like one container will be maybe costume earrings that, um, you know, have a pair, right? They're going to go sort immediately into one. This will be one that's got like broken pieces or an earring that's missing one or like a nice piece of jewelry that's missing stones or something like that will go into one. Maybe necklaces in here, maybe stuff that I know is silver or gold already, Maybe a, a lot of things that I need to do further inspection on because I suspect maybe it's more valuable. And then a, a section for, say, high-end costume jewelry that's branded or even high-end that I, isn't branded but I think might be a nice maker. I sort them out initially so that I kind of have an idea of what I'm working with here. And then I will approach each one of those separately and we can talk about what I do with those different types it, it is, uh, I probably need to say at this point that this video is not about telling you the quote-unquote right way or wrong way in order to uh, do this in your store or if you're going to sell or, or evaluate in your own things. I'm simply telling you what I do as a full-time reseller, which has served me well and allows me to make profit off of a large lot such as this. Generally speaking, folks, if I'm paying less than $10 for something I want to try to achieve 10 times my expense. So if I pay $2 for a piece of costume jewelry, I want to sell that for $20. If I pay three, I want to get $30. That's okay with me because if I factor in eBay fees and taxes and my cost of goods, to me, the sale of that is still enough for me to make the money that I want. That's not the right way to price it. That's what's right for me, for what I uh, think uh, I'm okay getting as a price. Now, if it's a $50 or a $100 item, it's not too often you're going to buy something for $100 and sell it for $1,000. you are not going to get 10 times X as the threshold of cost goes up. So that kind of is a different decision I have to make. And usually deciding on more expensive items, well... Let's get back to it, and I'll share that in a little bit. The very first one that I picked up here, I'm just going to tell you, kind of show you what I do. So I take pieces in bags, like, for example, these little things. You know, here's a pair of earrings that are together, okay? Just from an initial look, it looks like they got rhinestones. They may be gold-filled. They got the screw backs. Something's written on them. So that's going to go in one that is decent costume jewelry that requires an additional uh, look, right? Same thing over here. Here's one. It's got rhinestones. I'm not looking close enough to see if any of them are missing, although it looks like one's missing there. So that one's going to need repair. Okay, so that's going in a different one. That needs repair. This one right here looks like a nice little set. 
And if I can zoom in here, some rhinestones, maybe missing some on the sides. I'm not quite sure. But uh, if I look at the back, it says Sarah Coventry. Okay, I've got a uh, need, well, it looks like it definitely is missing some stones. So again, that's going in the missing pile. And then we got things like this where it says Weiss on it. Oh, nice. Now it is missing rhinestones, unfortunately, but it is a good brand. So I still got to go in there though because it's not complete. Here's one, uh, I don't see any maker on the back, but it looks intact, it looks decent. So the decent one goes in with the first thing and so on and so forth. If I find silver or gold, that goes separate. I just keep doing this, folks, until I've sorted it correctly and then I'll get it uh, everything in here and then we can approach those specifically. Okay, update here. I'm down to a tray like this that is very nicely sorted already. So I don't really have to do a whole lot with this. I'll do a cursory inspection, of course, uh, to figure out kind of what I'm looking at here. But as you can see, I've started to whittle it down over here, uh, I'm, but I'm, I'm only maybe 20 to 30% through. Uh, for general purposes, this is initial sort of stuff that has either standalone value or in small lots value. This is a deal that will hold anything that is non-jewelry related, like I've only got a thimble in there so far. Started to separate out some broken stuff here. This is just really cheap costume stuff that doesn't really have any value except for going in like uh, uh, jewelry lots by the pound. And then over here is stuff that requires further inspections, possibly silver or gold. So that's what we got so far, folks. I'm going to get back into it. But this is what I've discovered so far as far as some clearly higher end costume jewelry. Look at this. We've got some earrings, some brooches, beautiful reds and pinks. I know we got some Weiss stuff up here, some Lisner, some Crown Trafari, possibly some others. Rusty's hot tips. Oh, hey folks, hold on just a second. Did you know that we have other YouTube channels? Yes, we know that already, Rusty. Well, did you know that we drop some new videos on those channels today? like within minutes of this one dropping, go over and check out Postcard Planet, check out the What's Old channel, check out some of these other channels. You will not be disappointed. And also, you know, you know, subscribe if you can. Whew. Folks, it's taken about an hour and a half to get through everything there. I've loaded up the trash. And here's some of the goodies here. We'll go through some of this in a little bit. I'll talk about why I put these items up here on the table first, okay? Um, we're going to roll through, um, got several items, you know, even some little things like this to hold and display things if I want to use that at our antique store, for example. And then down here is where I have stuff sorted. So this pile is, you know, I can sell it in small lots or individually. Same here, okay? This is stuff that I either know is already gold, gold filled or silver, or requires additional uh, research or, or inspection or testing, okay? And then this stuff here is all items which um, are missing stones, but still have good quality. I'll either repair them myself or I'll sell them as things for people to repair. This is just junk jewelry that doesn't have much value. I'll sell it by the pound. This is all different uh, little beads, and uh, some are glass, some are others, some are more valuable than others. This is all pieces of jewelry, either vintage or newer, that have been strung together that are in necklaces already, or are just strings for uh, use in crafting or making jewelry. And then we have an additional lot of, look at all these old... Um, uh, rhinestones with the foil backs, different colors, different sizes, different shapes for different pieces of costume jewelry. This will be sold to someone who wants to repair pieces, that sort of thing. Uh, so now that you see that I've sorted this, again, I just paid $205 for everything that you're looking at here. Um, I expect to make some good money back on this investment, and I'm going to show you some things that I will sell quickly to make my money back, which is part of how we're going to get into the conversation about pricing items. So why don't we get into it? For pricing stuff like this, folks, what I like to do is I take individual pieces that are nice, and I'll use Google Lens 
or I'll look it up on eBay and I'll see if I find any that are just like it. And if I find pieces that are 20 or $30, what I'll do is I'll take the pieces out of here, regardless of actually how much I think I can sell them for. I'll take the highest priced pieces, the ones that are selling for the most. I will list them slightly under what the most recent sales are as a buy it now, and I'll try to sell them quickly. What I want to do, folks, is if I can, take a handful of pieces out of this entire lot. Maybe they're in here, maybe they're in uh, the bucket up there. Uh, but I want to find, let's say, a handful of pieces, half a dozen, ten pieces, and I want to try to get those sold quickly and get all of my money back. And here's why. If I'm able to take... A lot like this where they were maybe, I don't know, three or four hundred pieces of jewelry. If I can make all my money back with ten pieces in one week's time or two weeks' time, then I don't have to discount everything else. In fact, I can bump the price up and list it as a buy it now and just let offers come in. I can send offers, things like that. Once I've sold all the stuff, uh, the, the first stuff and made all my money back, then I can get the best value, the most money from the rest of everything else. Because over time, uh, it doesn't matter if it sells quickly or not because I'm not floating any money left. Here's a piece by a brain called H Hobie or, or Hobe. Um, it's like a cute little candle type brooch. We've got some Crown Jafari stuff in here, folks. Um, we have, um, this is just a piece of, uh, of plastic little Bakelite. I just held this out because I thought it was interesting. Um, you can see this green, uh, the green marbleized look here. It's really, uh, kind of cool. You can test that with semi-chrome polish. This would have been glued into place, but you see there's a single hole where they probably had a little metal post that went up into that to help to prevent movement. Uh, and that would have been on some sort of piece. It's loose, but I could sell it. People can use that. This was also an interesting piece. It's not a piece of jewelry. Um, it's a stone. It's a mineral that has a very light type of an etched scroll work going on in here. And uh, you can see, even see on the back, like this is the rough part of the stone. Um, I don't know if this is a, a, a type of jade, uh, if this is some sort of like a venturine or some kind of a lighter green stone. I have no idea how old it is. It looks handmade. Uh, that's pretty cool. We've also got a couple pieces here of carved angel skin coral. You can see this right here is nice and, and, and carved up as a pendant. It's on a gold filled chain. And we have some other really cool brands here represented. Some of these might be uh, nice boutique brands. I'm not exactly sure yet. But the point is, I do some research. I spend some time. I take each piece. I look it up. I look on the back. I see, is there any brand name? Is there any brand? No, nothing's represented here. You know, what about one of these? Nope, I'm not seeing anything on that one either. Um... But, you know, you keep going until you find one that does have something. Oh, here we go. Kru or Kairu, something like that. A-R-K-E, Inc. So I can look that piece up, of course. Here's a little bracelet. Going to look on the latch here. The top, nothing. Got anything on the back? Oh, Surprise. It's Crown Trafari, as you can see. There's Trafari with the little crown above it. So that's nice. You know, we got some good pieces here. I know uh, we've got some nice value. Look at this. Uh, this is a beautiful piece. Unfortunately, it's missing several rhinestones. And I'm hoping that maybe a bunch of those stones that came in this lot can help me. But there's a lot to be done here, folks. A lot of pieces missing. Lots of, I mean, this is almost so much you can't replace. It's too bad because this is a, what a cool piece. This is a holly craft, you can see down here, and this might still sell. I mean, even with missing some stones, somebody might take this and they might want to harvest the stones. They might want to repair it. Um, it's easy to look something like that up. Here's something that looks very basic, but I think it's made out of silver. And you look down here and it says... There's that there's that name that I never pronounce correctly, uh, uh, Zivanchi or G Givanchi, Givinci, Givinci. 
Givenchy. <laughs> I could go on. Every time I say it, I say it wrong. And, and people get on and tell me, uh, Rusty, it's pronounced like this. And except I get 10 different uh, types that, uh, of pronunciations from people. So I still don't know. I still don't know. But I'm going to look it up. You know, I'm going to see. I think they, these can bring really good prices. The point is, I think... Even without having to research this, I could sell everything on this table for $200, $205, get all my money back, and that's not including the stuff up here. Folks, I looked up some of these pieces, and it's looking like pieces just like these, or the equivalents, are selling for around $20 to $25 on average. So I put a few of these nicer pieces, these some clear rhinestones, Aurora Borealis, some nice pinks and purples, flower, a pendant, some other little brooches, and then some beautiful uh, rhinestone earrings. This lot right here, if I sell them individually, which we're talking about a dozen listings, should yield me $200. I should be able to make $200 off of just this stuff based on eBay comps, which means some of these that are still sitting over here, which I pulled these from, have value. I can make money off of that. All of the gold and the silver and the gold filled stuff, I can make profit off of. And all of this stuff here, which has is the semi-sorted but not fully sorted stuff, the beads, the necklaces, everything else, strictly profit because my cost is already back to me. Of course, I'm going to lose my eBay fees. Of course, I've got to hold money back for my taxes. But you can see what a large lot that was, and just what I could essentially fit in my hand if I put it together can get me my investment back. All right, this right here is going to get me everything back that I spent. Not too bad for standing in line for about 30 minutes. It took me 10 minutes to gather it and pay, and I was out the door. Whenever I'm paying more money for a single item, $50, $100, $500 for something, I need to know not only that I'll be confident to sell it for a good amount above what I'm spending, but also that it will sell fast. I'm not at a place in my business where I can float multiple hundreds or thousands of dollars for several months. That's just not the way that I operate my business. If you can, that's awesome. But whenever I'm going to buy something, let's take a piece of fine jewelry, jewelry, for example. Maybe I come across a gold necklace or a gold bracelet, and they know it's gold. and They want $200 for it. And I think I could probably sell that for $500, $200, that's a lot. When I look at that, if it's going to take me six months to sell that, it's a pass. But if I think I can sell that in one auction cycle in seven days, it's a buy. I want to get that money back very quickly if I'm going to spend that much. So for cheaper items, $10 or less, I try to hit the 10 times my expense. Three, $5, I need to be making $30 to $50 on those. Now, I pass up lots of stuff for 2 and $3 because I know I can't make that back. But if it's more expensive, like an instrument, I'll pay $2,000, $3,000 for a Gibson instrument if I'm going to be able to sell that for 5 I don't want to wait two years to sell that for 5 I need to sell that for 5 in 30 to 60 days. If I can't do that, it's a pass. Well, folks, of the nicer stuff, this is where we're at. I've tested the gold pieces. I haven't tested the silver yet. I'll get back to you in a little bit. This is the stuff I need to test that I'm not sure of. This is the stuff that has, not only is it marked, but it has passed the initial test of the magnet. And when things are marked, when it's silver, if it's marked and it's not magnetic, I don't typically do any further testing. Is it possible um, it's not? Is it possible that they're cheating me? Or, you know, Possibly they marked it incorrectly, but most of the time that doesn't happen because silver is not that terribly valuable. This is the stuff right here that has tested out or, in, or is marked as gold filled. Gold filled jewelry, folks. Uh, I get about a dollar per gram. This is quite. This one's quite heavy. Um, I like to put it together. Um, I've got a big a bag here. I'm working on various cost uh, uh, other jewelry, old stuff that's gold filled. It's going to go in that bag. I'm going to save it till I have several hundred grams, and then I'll sell it in one lot. But this is the great part here, folks. 
look at this and I actually bumped it but this is where we're at this piece here this little brooch or this little pin oh come on now this little pin right here um this ring that has some stones and this oddity it's like a it's like a pendant, but it's got some sort of markings on it, little glass eyeball looking things. Um, these three pieces are all solid 10 karat gold. Moving over here, we've got this broken chain. No one tested, no one probably thought to look at it at all because it has no clasp. This single earring, which is missing the stud and also its partner. And then these two wonderful earrings right here with these stones in them. You can see the back. It's got open for those stones for light to pass through. These, this line is solid 14 karat gold. This brand is a pretty well known or an older costume brand called Kremens, K R E M E N T Z. They did, however, do a, they did a lot of gold filled jewelry, but they did make a, some pieces out of 14 karat solid gold. It was hard to read it on the stud here, but it does say Kremens. It's been tested. It is definitely solid gold, and they're heavy. And then these two pieces right here. I've sold one of these, uh, several of these in the last couple of years, and always I get them in these lots. The necklace almost always is a gold-filled necklace. It says gold-filled, and they think, okay, well, not terribly valuable. Uh, and even on the little ring up here, it says GF, gold-filled. And this little uh, pendant is gold-filled as well. But guess what's inside, folks? Inside are solid gold flakes solid gold specimens they sold these in places like alaska and colorado and probably in california as keepsakes things that people can go but the last one of these that i sold sold for ninety dollars ninety dollars for this one piece and then this right here folks is an antique ring let me see if i can get over here so i can zoom an antique ring it is missing the stone but this is 18 karat solid gold, white gold, etched, pretty cool looking, no stone. I'm going to see if I have a diamond that size. If not, I'm going to see if I have another stone that would look nice that I can put in there. Or you could just sell it as is. Put, someone else would put a stone in there. But folks, I'm so excited. I'm telling you right now that between this gold filled jewelry, some of this will end up being sterling, and what's not can go in a grab bag or with the other costume pieces. The sterling here. 10 carat, 14 carat, 18 carat, gold filled but solid gold inside. All of this, folks, I'm going to double my investment, at least double my $200 off of all of this. I still have some chains. This one right here is testing for some gold. This one here and this one here. Big, heavy pieces. If they turn out to be solid gold, oh my goodness. I don't think they are. I think they're gold filled. But again, I get, folks, a dollar per gram. And these necklaces, these chains together, probably weigh two to 300 grams. I'm not kidding you. They're heavy, which means if they're just gold filled, then I'm looking at two to $300 just off of these. These links are really cool. They're all pretty uh, interestingly, uh, they're etched on, on the edges, different types. I uh, have a gold, uh, a solid gold 10 carat uh chain like this right now that is on auction it's going to end on friday it's already been bid up to 900 and some dollars uh because it's heavy and it's solid gold so that has nothing to do with all of these costume pieces we've shown and talked about how i'll sell those and then the beads and all the other costume stuff here folks that i'm going to get to later on but that is how i do my work. I buy a lot. I take the most valuable stuff that'll sell the fastest for the most money. I get all my money back. I get into profit. And then I don't have to stress about that. That's the stuff that will sell over time. I can kind of play with the price even more. And it helps me build up inventory in my store uh, for later on. While we're at it, folks, there are several pieces in here that are going to require some uh, repair. And it's really not that difficult to do. You can see I'm missing one stone here and one here. And I've got them. Luckily, they're still here. So what I'm going to do is just take some little jewelry glue, jewelry and bead E6000. But there's various types. So folks, I'm just going to put a little dab in here 
a little dab in there, stick them into place, and it's done. It's easy, as long as you have the stones, or like I've mentioned before, don't just toss stuff that's missing stones. You can still sell those people who will use them for crafting things, maybe they'll repair them, or hold on to them so you can harvest stones to repair other pieces as they come in. I've got a lot of work to do. I've got an entire bin full. In fact, you know what? Let me just show you. Here is a bunch of those that we looked at earlier. Look at my whole, look at this. This entire thing is full of jewelry, which is missing, gemstones, pieces, even whole, look at this, whole brooches that have been, all of the stones have been harvested. This is a wise uh, uh, piece that someone has harvested all of the stones from. Oh my goodness. So I just have that. I'm going to probably sell it separately, but I mean, I've just got oodles and oodles of these. Some of these are fantastic pieces, but they're missing a single stone, right? Just one stone is all it takes. And someone's like, oh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pay you full price for that. Um, but anyhow, I've got tons in here. I've got some really nice ones, like some Juliana pieces, earrings. You can see the wire construction in here. Except, uh, you know, I'm just missing a couple tiny pink stones in that. I gotta see, I imagine that I have several I can repair just from ones I put in here recently. But you can see there's some really cool ones here. It's just missing the one. Once I get that in place, that's a nice little brooch. So it makes sense, folks, especially if you're going through volumes and volumes of stuff like I do, to hold on to pieces that have cool stones because you might be able to harvest some and repair others. A few more exciting things to show you. This came in to the warehouse yesterday, and uh, we're going to lay her down here. Um, and we're going to show you what we got here. So... What you're looking at, folks, is a, best I can tell, either a 1948 or 1949 Gibson LG2 model acoustic guitar. She's quiet, a looker. Let me put her down here. And um, the deal is these guitars are quite collectible. Uh, very sought after, specifically for... Um, kind of bluegrass artists, folk artists, uh, sometimes country, and, and even rock uh, music. But these vintage guitars are uh, hard and harder to come by in good condition. <clears throat> now, I bought this one thinking that uh, it would be a potentially a good resale opportunity. Um, but but <clears throat> upon inspecting it, it turns out, unfortunately, um, it's not as good of a situation as maybe it seemed. Uh, we're missing the sound hole, uh, 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 not the sound hole, we're missing the uh, uh, the pin here for the strap, uh, strap peg at the bottom. You can see some heavy scratches and stuff. That stuff doesn't concern me as much. The top looks fairly clean, but if you turn it to the side here, you see some pretty significant bowing right here. And what has uh, happened is the top has just bowed over time based on probably, can, you know, where it was stored, temperature, fluctuations and things. And then this tortoiseshell colored pick guard uh, is starting to come up along the edges. That's also pretty common, not a big deal either. Um, the, uh, the bridge here has not lifted up or there's no cracks in it right now, so that's a, that's a good sign. But um, <clears throat> the problem is that, and you can't see it inside of here, but this instrument is what is called, uh, it's X-braced, which means exactly what it sounds like. The major bracing of the top is, uh, uh, it goes right here and right here in a big X. And then you've got some lateral braces um, on both the base and the treble side and the lower bout and the upper part. Now, because this top has, um, you know, has bowed like this and, and the shape of that has changed, it's caused the braces underneath to detach and hang down. That's a problem because that uh, it, we don't have solid support for this top. I don't want this top to crack or pop off from the tension that the strings put on this bridge because these they tighten up, it pulls this direction on the strings and uh, we don't want to cause some cracks in the top over here. So that's going to need to be redone. 
Um, we also have an issue where even though it plays okay up here, on about midway down, it starts to get some buzzing. And again, that's because of the change in the pitch from the top here. Also, the neck itself has bowed a little bit over time and it's probably in uh, about time to get what they call a neck reset, which means they have to put uh, steamed air down in here to soften up or melt the glue almost so that they can detach the neck and then they put it back in at the proper angle. If they have to shim it, they do that and glue it back into place. It is a lot of work on an instrument like this. While they're at it, they might as well just refret it and stuff. I took it to a luthier here in my local area. He said we're looking at somewhere in the $1,400 to $1,800 range just to do the repair work. Now, of course, none of this stuff was probably even known, certainly not disclosed. Um, by uh, the seller. And so what I've done is I've taken that information, I've sent it on back on to the seller and said, hey, listen, you probably didn't know, but here's the deal. Uh, it needs this work, this, that, this, and that. And um, I basically gave them the option, well, you can either um, give me a partial refund to help me, aid me, in the, look at the roughness on the back. It's, boy, it has been played all the way through the, the lacquer there. Um, but essentially, I said, you can either uh, help me out by, you know, it's just a beautiful guitar. Give me a refund where I may have to just send this puppy back. I hate to send it back. But Gibson LG2s, just to give you frame of reference here, it's hard to buy one of these for less than $4,000 today, uh, especially one from the 1940s. This is not what they consider a banner uh, um, LG2 because the script, which was switched over in, I think, 1947, they switched it to this. Um, and there's some features on here that, that date it prior to 1950. That's why I'm saying it's a 1948 to 49. It's a great instrument. Uh, I would love to restore it. However, I don't want to spend over 50% of the cost you know, the, uh, of what I was into this instrument. But it's cool to have it in. I really hope uh, we can come to some sort of deal because uh, I would love to play this instrument uh, between now and whenever it could sell. Thanks so much for sticking around today, cousins. We'll see you next week with a whole slew of new videos. But make sure to check out those little other channels. You won't be disappointed. Happy hunting. Be -do -bo -bo -bo. Let's go make some money. Rusty, rusty, rusty hair.